Welcome everyone. And thank you all for joining us this Saturday afternoon for the long awaited book launch for a uh, late Professor Eliud Martinez's collection of short fiction, Wero Wero, The White Mexican and Other Published and Unpublished Stories. My name is Katie Porter and I am Executive Director of Inlandia Institute, a literary and cultural arts nonprofit based in inland Southern California. But before we begin, Inlandia Institute respectfully acknowledges and recognizes our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kauia, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. And now a few housekeeping notes. We want you to know that closed captioning is available for this event via the CC icon on the lower part of your screen. Or conversely, if you do not need it, you can click the up arrow to the right of that CC button to hide the subtitles. And also uh, please note that this is being recorded and it is a view only presentation. If you do have questions for any of our speakers at any time, please type them into the Q&A box. So uh, just a little bit of background before we get started, but Professor Martinez has long been a friend to Inlandia. He and his students were some of our very first presenters at the main library in downtown Riverside. And I'd like to um, share a couple of pictures with you. I'll get back to this one in just a moment. Um, But here uh, is Eliud at an early Inlandia event, and you might recognize the gentleman in the red shirt standing with him, uh, another professor at UCR, uh, Juan Felipe Herrera, who went on to become the US Poet Laureate. And there, of course, is his lovely wife, Elise, and some other friends of Inlandia. And here is Eliud um, presenting alongside his students. And uh, so we've just, we've known him for a very long time. And I was uh, very happy to know that he had a collection of short stories that was looking for a home. And uh, shortly before the pandemic, uh, back in November of 2019, we officially accepted this manuscript, uh, but it was a long time coming. There was, um, of course, the pandemic, and there were a lot of steps that go into publishing a book. But what I knew when I first picked up the stories was that they were uh, absolutely engaging and full of uh, historical fact and uh, chock full of Eliud's own philosophies about uh, life and Chicano literature. Um, over the course of Eliud's long career, he championed the concept of multiple ancestries and in doing so changed the face of public university education. He introduced the first multi-ethnic literature course at UCR, Chicano Literature in Comparative Ethnic Perspective. And then in 1985, he developed the course Introduction to Race and Ethnicity, followed by Creative Writing and Ancestry in 1991 the latter two becoming required courses for majors and minors in creative writing. In addition to Wero Wero, the white Mexican and other published and unpublished stories, Eliud is also the author of the novel Voice Haunted Journey and editor of the anthology of student work, American Identities, California Short Stories of Multiple Ancestries, as well as a nonfiction book, The Art of Mariano Asuelo, um, and, and sadly, uh, while the work book was in production, uh, Eliud Martinez did pass away. So um, he is not here to speak today, but on his behalf, we do have his wife, Elise, and his daughters, Tanya and Laura. So at this time, I would like to introduce them. Welcome, Elise and Tanya and Laura.
Welcome to everyone today. We have a large group uh, from around the US and I'm thrilled. Well, uh, to Riverside friends and the UCR alumni, glad to have you. Bienvenidos to the Texas relatives. To New York, hi. And to Canada, hi. And even um, in Warsaw, we have our dear professor friend Eva watching us today, hi. Uh, we have uh, North Carolina and Vegas. And anyone else I've forgotten, please forgive. You can see me, as she said, but uh, I cannot see you. So later you can do a question and answer uh, typed in. I'm so glad you could join us to celebrate this new short story book uh, by our favorite, one of our favorite people, my late beloved husband, Eliud Martinez. Much thanks to Katie Porter and Inlandia Institute for publishing the book and all the work they've done for us. Thank you to Jordan Lund for reading today and to Francis Vasquez and Roberto Cantu for being on the panel. They've put in many hours of work. Uh, <clears throat> now I will share about one of my favorite stories, the German Mauser. This is about the rifle Eliud's grandfather, Eusebio, carried in the Mexican Revolution. He carved the date, 1911, and initials EMO, which were uh, for Eusebio Martinez Ortiz. Um, now, Eliud and his father, Estroberto, talked often of the stories from his grandfather uh, in, in time of war. I wondered if you want to show the picture. Grandfather always carried a notebook in his pocket, and he wrote and wrote too, but his stories got eaten by a goat, and now Eliud had to become the scribe for the rest of his family stories. Yes, you see the notebook there. That is stories he wrote everywhere he went, just like Eliud and all the bullets, that's from the revolution. That's his handsome grandfather. <clears throat> uh, um, so he, the, the rifle and saber were so important to Eliud. Every time he went to Texas, he and his father would shine him up. They would talk about the history. It was so important to him, the connection to the past. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, on a visit to Austin, his dad said, Elise and Eliud sit down. And he presented us with the saber and rifle to take back to Riverside. And they were Eliud's. And he was so touched. Now, uh, I will uh, share the rifle minute with you. Now, you can maybe, oops. Uh, higher the date. Uh, oh, it's upside down, isn't it? E, e, oh, it's still upside down. <laughs> oh, I don't know what. Okay, it's going to be backwards like a mirror. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember how to. How would I do that, guys? Anyway, the date is 11, 1911 in there, and it's carved in by his grandfather. Okay, it's very, very heavy. How they carry these, I do not know. It's very, very heavy. Now, I just read the last few sentences from the story on page 111, the German Mauser. And this is the ending of the story. <clears throat> when we got the rifle, we laughed together warmly. I thought about my grandfather and my head filled with romantic notions about the magic of heredity. At that moment, I felt in my heart now that the rifle and saber were mine, that the spirit of my grandfather had come, become one with my own. Beautiful, and I want to send a Brussels to everyone. Good afternoon. Today, I think about how my dad would feel to be a part of this book launch. I know he would be filled with appreciation and love for all of us. And he'd be so grateful that we're all here today honoring him and his passion for art and literature. 
oh, we would love to be able to hear his voice again and talk with him about all of these short stories. The good thing is he knew this book was in process. And I can remember a day within the last year where my mom shared with me her meeting out on the patio, a COVID friendly meeting. And Katie Porter looked into my parents' family room and saw the beautiful painting that my father had done years ago of his family that was to be decided to be the cover for this wonderful book. I try to keep in mind that every day is a blessing and I'm so thankful for all the years that we had with my father and for the inspiration and teachings he shared with me. And I also wanna thank Katie and everyone today for making this um, book possible and also for honoring the book and my father today. I found that I read this book easily and I really thoroughly enjoyed the writing style. I could see and feel through my father's words, the emotion and feelings that he saw and felt. A few of my favorite stories uh, were firstly, uh, the world of Dolores Velasquez, where he describes his mother in her last years of life. She talks about her reflection on life. He just talks about being a Mexican woman. I'm so thankful also to my Tia Bell, Isabel in the story. Uh, she is their only daughter and she has been a loving caretaker to many in the family, including mi abuela and mi abuelo. She's an inspiration to me for her selflessness, her love, and also her tremendous sense of humor. Like my mother, I also really love the story of the German Mauser. I know that my father attributes much of his love of writing to his grandfather. He always talked about his grandfather's notebooks and how his grandfather fought in the Mexican Revolution. My dad was extremely proud and honored to be gifted the German Mauser by his father, and he loved and protected it as though it was his own grandfather himself. He would display it prominently on our mantle growing up. And just touching the German Mauser gives off an energy that brings back stories and history of my Mexican ancestors. It teaches us about the value of respect, loyalty, and admiration of our loved ones that have come before us, and also about passing down traditions and stories for our loved ones after us to know and understand better their own heritage. Thank you. I'm now gonna send this over to Tanya. I'm so grateful that my mom and dad were able to work on these stories together uh, before my father passed and that the Inlandia Institute has published them for all of us to read. Through reading them, I felt I got to know more about my dad and learn about him even though he has passed on. I only wish that he were still here so I could discuss them with them as these stories are very thought provoking. And it is interesting to me how relevant they are to the current times. I feel honored that the first story is about my and my dad's father-daughter relationship when he talks about my playing the piano. It demonstrates our playful and rebellious nature that we both have and had. I believe I inherited this from my father. I feel proud that my father stood up against simplistic views about race and ethnicity. In the last story in his book, he discusses the censorship, the intimidation, and the denial of ancestry that needs to be understood. He writes that, quote, the arts must reconnect us with our ancestors and with our progeny, quote. And, quote, one should be watchful of people who are afflicted with historical amnesia. They follow a trend to judge the past simplistically 
with ignorance and others who know the past are intimidated into saying that two and two makes three, quote. I see this going on regarding American history as well as other topics. And I think it is very important to learn from this last story as well as many others in the book. The book is both entertaining and educational. And I want to thank everyone who is here today who has read it or is going to read it after today. I will enjoy discussing it with all of you who wish and learning more about the ancestries and my father. Thank you. Thank you very much for Elise and Laura and Tanya and Thank you for allowing us to get to know your father better through his work. Uh, at this time, uh, I would like to bring forward a sp another special guest who is going to read uh, some of Eliud's work from the book. Uh, this, uh, we have with us today, Jordan Lund. Jordan has been acting for 50 years. He trained at Carnegie Mellon University and has appeared in over 80 films and TV shows and about 150 plays. Over the years, he's been directed by and acted alongside numerous Oscar, Tony, and Emmy award winners. And for the last 25 years, he's also been teaching and coaching actors, first in Los Angeles and now in Riverside. Jordan is married to Rabbi Suzanne Singer of Riverside Temple Bethel. So welcome, Jordan. Hi, thanks very much. Um, Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, so I just wanted to mention first, I'm going to read um, from the world of Dolores Velasquez. And I just wanted to let everybody know that when their call went out, when they needed an actor to play a Mexican grandmother, I believe I was the first person that was on everybody's lips. And so I'm going to be reading from the world of Dolores Velasquez. They grew up so fast. And now I wonder where the years went. How did we get so old? Who would have known that Antonio and I would live so long? Who could have imagined we would have such a large family? Every day they come to visit, except for Miguel. He's too far away. If only he would write. Isabel, has Miguel written? No, Mama, but he telephoned. He's coming to see you. And this time, Natalie and Sarah and Becky are coming with him. Next week, vienen la semana próxima. Los cuatro, los periódicos dicen que viene un norte y que va a hacer mucho frío. She tells me that the weather reports say a bad norther is bringing some very cold weather when they come. Now, this is one of the worst winters in Texas in a long, long time. And you know, Mama, you know, Mama Sarah habla español. You'll be able to talk with her in Spanish. Que bueno, hija. Yeah. Last night I was thinking about what it was like to be a girl in the old days. And for a long time I could not get to sleep. I was aching all over. Oh, pobrecita Isabel. She'd fallen asleep in her chair. If sleeping in a bed is uncomfortable, it must be much more uncomfortable to sleep in a chair. And I finally fell asleep. And just before closing my eyes, I was thinking about Miguel's daughters. When the little one was five or six years old, I don't remember exactly, they came to visit. Her sister's a little older, two years, I think. Well, maybe they were a little older than that, but they were little. And one evening, the little girls made me laugh so much. I was sitting in my armchair. And Miguel and I were watching one of the telenovelas on the Mexican television station, and I heard them laughing. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw them in the hall. And then I turned my head and saw them. They were laughing and holding hands, going into the bathroom to take a bath all by themselves. 
and they didn't have any clothes on. Oh, my heavens, Diosito mio. There they were, little Sarah and little Rebecca, just like on the day they were born, and I could not help laughing out loud. Now, Gail asked me why I laughed. He was sitting on the sofa. He could not see his little girls. He asked me again, Por que se remere, mama? And I told him, Your little girls, tu sihitas, Miguel. They just went into the bathroom. I saw them in the hallway without any clothes on, just like the day when they were born. And they were not at all embarrassed about their bodies. Miguel told me that he and Natalie were bringing up their daughters to respect their bodies, to know that there is nothing shameful about the body. And that day, I thought how different it used to be for girls, for women in the old days. My mother was always telling us girls to keep our knees together, to sit properly. She used to get so angry about the way we would sit. No andan encelados, sus vergüenzas. No se siente como los hombres. Don't sit like the men do. Keep your legs together. <laughs> so I'm glad for Isabel for my daughters-in-law and for my granddaughters, that some things have changed for women. Uh, they went to school, they learned how to read and write, and the daughters are in school now. The next generation of women will have good jobs too. My granddaughters take pride in their jobs. Whenever one of them buys a new car, she drives it over to show it to me. Look, Vuela, I bought a new car. Si me da mucho gusto por ellas. They have good jobs and they buy nice clothing, dress nicely all the time. Yes, they speak English and they drive their own cars and they have their own money to spend. When a woman can drive, she does not have to depend on a man to take her anywhere. Things were much different in the old days. Even so. I always found it very annoying when any of my daughters-in-law or my granddaughters would sit down at the table to eat before the men or expect to be served as if they were men. Me daba mucho coraje. I could not help it. I could never get used to it. How dare they act as if they were men? Isabel, did you prepare something to eat for your brothers? Mama, estamos en el hospital. We're in the hospital. Most muchachos ate before coming to see you. Thank you so much, Jordan, for giving us a taste of that story. And for those who might be wondering, um, many of the stories are semi-autobiographical, although names have been uh, changed in the text. And Jordan is uh, connected to this family as their uh, members of Temple Bethel. So thank you very much. And we'll be hearing from him again uh, in a little bit with another story. But uh, for this next segment, I would like to introduce you to one of Eliud's students, as well as one of Eliud's colleagues, both of whom he called friend. Frances J. Vasquez is the daughter of immigrant parents from Mexico. She attended Riverside schools and earned BS and MBA degrees from UC Riverside. An aficionada of arts and letters, she loves arts and cultural events and volunteers as a guide at Riverside Art Museum. She is director emerita of the Inlandia Institute and serves on its programs committee and advisory council. Roberto Cantu was born in Guadalajara, Mexico he is Professor Emeritus of Chicano and Latino Studies and Professor Emeritus of English at California State University, Los Angeles. His latest publication is Homecoming Trails in Mexican American Cultural History, which is dedicated to Eliud in memory of his work on multiple ancestries and Mexican American culture. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce Francis and Roberto. Welcome. Thank you very much, Katie. I appreciate that a lovely uh, um, introduction. Thank you, audience, for being here. I want to tell you that Dr. Eliud Martinez was my favorite professor at UC Riverside. 
but we met before I was his student. As a community activist, I took part in giving Chancellor Tomas Rivera a hearty, wonderful welcome fiesta at the Riverside Convention Center. Perhaps I met Eliu there, or perhaps at a reception on campus to introduce a cadre of new Chicano Latino faculty to the community. We became friends. When I informed him that I was going to attend UCR, he was encouraging, supportive, and gave me sage advice. As a re-entry student with three sons to care for and a job, my focus was to take mostly post courses in my major to graduate quickly. I treated myself with Chicano literature courses taught by Dr. Martinez. He was a marvelous, expansive teacher. His classes actually nourished my soul. I learned about Chicana, Latino, Hispanic authors. I read, because of him, the works of Carlos Fuentes, Juan Rulfo, Rosario Castellanos, Marta Trava, Elena Poniatowska, Rodolfo Acuna, Ron Arias, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez, Rudolfo Anaya, Jose Montoya, Gabriela Mistral, and of course, Tomas Rivera. Eliud loved hearing stories about my family and encouraged me to write them. He advised me to aggrandize certain elements. He even suggested a title, Mi Nana Fumaba Puros, which means my Nana smoked cigars, which she actually didn't. She did smoke Raleigh cigarettes. Our friendship was enduring. Eliud's impact on me was profound and is relevant today. I want to, at this point, uh, ask uh, Roberto Cantu, Professor Cantu, my understanding. Uh, Roberto, is you're a Corsican brother of Eliud? <laughs> and uh, in any case, how would you describe Miguel's relationship with his family? Before I answer your thoughtful question, let me. <laughs> Thank uh, Elise and his daughters, uh, Laura and Tanya, for inviting me. Let me also thank and congratulate Cardi Porter for this uh, wonderful tribute to uh, my Corsican brother, Eliud, as you reminded me. <laughs> and uh, originally, I planned a three hour lecture for this event. And so I want to thank you, Florence, for. Uh, suggesting that instead of a lecture, that we have a conversation. So it's a wonderful idea. And uh, now on that, uh, I like to say that uh, um, Miguel Velasquez is at the core of uh, Eliud's work. What I'd like to do is in our conversation to discuss not only uh, Eliud as a person, but also uh, how his life becomes very much a part of his writing. So with that, uh, go ahead and ask me questions that you think will bring the person and the writer together. Mm -hmm. Well, we saw so many connecting themes in this book, this collection of 20 short stories so many of them are uh, talked about family, the close communications uh, with family. We saw the notebooks, the notebook on the table that was always there, the, the um, notebook in the grandfather's um, um, po uh, pocket. Um, Eliud himself always carried a, a notebook. Um, we saw love, lots of love, familial love, passionate love, so many, uh, so much. Um, what, what is it about Miguel that these themes, family, love, and remembering uh, was so important? With our question and with the name of Miguel, we are, are focusing on fiction. And it's a good uh, point to keep in mind. Uh, 
for that, I like for us to contextualize your question and to uh, uh, remember that Eliud's work was projected as a trilogy. It was meant to be the notebooks of Miguel Velasquez. The first uh, installment, so to speak, of the trilogy was Voice Hunter Journey. And uh, the second, the title was The Obstinate Blood. And the third was going to be The Joint Appointment. That's a storyteller's work that uh, is based on something that has been conceived in embryo based on stories received from the family, from teachers, from one's culture. With this, let me begin by clarifying before answering the question, what stories meant to elude. Stories were not just tales told by someone who like a spider, uh, weaves his quilt with uh, silk taken out of his own gut. No. To elude uh, stories were received through word of mouth from parents, grandparents, from uh, the culture around the writer, and the wisdom and the biases of the past. So what you have in a view in writing about family, about love, about racism, about looking for a home, that comes not only from stories told, stories heard in the dining room from grandmothers, from parents, uh, memories through objects, whether it be a savior or uh, a rifle, and all that becomes part of a youth work, and uh, that becomes the inner chemistry of a writer that he sees ahead because he knows what's behind him. Knowing that, you will see that in Voice on the Journey, we have references to a wedo wedo in part two, chapter two of the novel. In fact, we have a whole trilogy already in the first installment, Voice Hunter Journey, which is the only novel that he published. What I think is that based on those stories, it was already a collage of stories that formed a novel and a trilogy. Therefore, the special, the very exclusive role that Wedo Wedo has as his posthumous publication. In it, he fulfilled the promise, which was, of course, the obstinate blood and the joint appointment. In the joint appointment, Elu Martinez meant to question and criticize not only Chicano studies, for its fixation on native Mexican Islam, but also, and to me, very important, to question American education based on specialization as he found in Illinois, the University of Illinois, from which he dropped out and told one of his professors that he would rather go back cleaning tables than to take classes from him because he already had a model. And that is something we must remember. And then you said that frequently, and I put him in the biographical article I published on his work in 1992 in the Dictionary of Biography of Chicano Authors. But he was ruled and governed by one trinity. And that was art, history and fate. 
and faith comes to you. And that comes from some good, dedicated German and Irish teachers that he had in elementary school that taught him everything they had at their disposal, treating them as their own children. The other was, of course, his professor, Donald Weisman, who became a model with a large scope of interest, poetry, writing novels, film producer, painter. He becomes almost like a hated chance encounter, so to speak, that became his benchmark to who he wanted to be. This is very important to remember because the world around eluded because of Jim Crow politics in Texas, because of inferior schools for Mexicans and Blacks, and eluded remembers that. There was little chance for Blacks and Mexicans to succeed. So you find in this wonderful German Irish teachers, this professor who believed in him, that was a miracle. That was an act of faith that sent a youth into the garden. Now, with this in mind, we have to understand a youth's life was blessed from the beginning. He was very lucky. He was an iconoclast when the University of Texas at Austin wanted to enforce faith in a supreme God. Uh, and you protested with some of his classmates. And uh, he tells us that he dressed as a Christ with a loincloth, some crown of mesquite thorns. He went out there with his beard, his curly hair, and everyone was shocked. The dean of his university told him that he could be expelled. He didn't care. He had to do it. To be surprised, uh, he was seen as a radical, as a communist, because he looked like Fidel Castro, <laughs> because of the beard. I saw a photo, he looks more like Dionysus than like Jesus Christ. So all this led to eventful uh, changes in the Israel. So his writing has to be seen in the broadest terms possible of his plans, how the stories that he received from the past, from his uh, parents, his grandparents, his awareness, all that became part of, of his story. Roberto, uh, that's beautiful to tell us. And I remember Eliu telling me that story of when he um, um, what walked the streets of Austin to protest. And uh, I, uh, he always had wonderful stories. And in this book, uh, in Wero Wero, um, they're, they're just uh, amazing, beautiful stories. And another theme that we were looking at that runs through uh, these stories are remembering and memories. And, and for example, in the chapter, The Forgotten List, uh, Antonio, the, uh, Miguel's uh, uh, father, he felt compelled to, to remember stories and he would have vivid dreams beginning at about the age of 80. He began to have these vivid dreams and he felt a need. He's, and I'm going to quote, I need to tell my memories and the story of my life. And also in, in Wero Wero, um, it, you, you, there's reference there about the notebook was always on the kitchen table. So it seems like it's a uh, generation, five generations of, of, of in this family of people who are storytellers. As Eliud used to tell us in class, narradores del valle, that's what he would uh, uh, call them. But in any case, um, also, um, you touched on the racism uh, that helped 
shape um, uh, eludes thoughts. Could you ex uh, expand more on that? Elude has a way of writing that on first impression, you either think that it's just too convoluted, too confusing, because you haven't read Latin American literature. Carlos Fuentes, Julio Cortese, Faulkner, Absalom Absalom. This kind of storytelling is not the union. It is more like a mural by Diego Rivera. Mm -hmm. It's a collage. Therefore, the writer asks you to be a natural reader, to participate, because art is transformative. It is not just for decoration. By reading, you are remaking yourself. So what we have is racism has to be contextualized in this uh, galaxy of topics in a lead. I would even say that a lead knew it. So let me remind you, for example, of the uh, three epigraphs you and I find in Voice Hunter Journey. One is from an ancient man, and guess what? The title is Collages. The other is Aldous Huxley, counterpoint. And the third is a German Jew, Heinrich Heine, self-portrait. And you and I might know that many readers will skip the epigraphs. That's a big mistake because mm -hmm. the epigraphs are a code, three keys to a huge aesthetics and poetics. Remember how Anais Nu says, every novelist knows that in real life, he or she is going to find one of his characters incarnated in someone else. Give you a gossip and brothers. Aldous Hartley says, why do we have those linear boring novels? Why not a novel about novelists? And that novelist writes about another novelist, and so on, and so on, and so on. This process of artists, this process of writers, telescoping for one. And then, of course, Harvey Heine, central to Elie. Artists, I think, are so frustrated and so angry at literary critics such as myself, who tell artists what to like, what to do. And artists say, I didn't write for you. I wrote for myself and a certain ideal reader with a sensibility to understand me. And Irish Heine says, to write a self-portrait is to you know you're going to lie. Because even Rousseau, if I go, even Rousseau was and true to his life. Therefore, when you and I read Elude, we have to realize it is creative fiction. Excuse the redundancy. Because good fiction is always creative. And by that, we have to take a stand, be more like Elude, an iconoclast, rebellious, and see what we read in Elude in our own terms. So, race. Let me begin with this. The Forgotten List is one of his best stories because we have someone on his 80s, and Jordan and I are glad we're still in our 30s. We don't know what old, old age means, but on his 80th birthday, knowing that he has a covenant with God. He wants to live to a hundred years. He begins to remember. He begins to think of all his friends that have died, who are buried in a local Mexican cemetery. All those secrets and stories never told. And what happens? This is a beautiful part. 
He has dreams. And in his dreams, written like through a surrealist aesthetic, they come to him from those dreams. And those dreams, the cemetery, stories untold from the past, is precisely what inspires a youth. We find that in the collector of stories, which is a conclusion of the world way. 20 stories, which end up with a moment of recognition, some form of collective epiphany, some way of collecting all the stories with some kind of poetic artistic unity. They become virtually a novel, better yet, they become the two last novels he never wrote. He fulfilled his promise, posthumously. And what you and I know is that Elio Martinez would walk in a Confederate cemetery and then in a Mexican cemetery. And he would wonder, are we to be segregated even after death? And what of all those stories of Mexicans who don't matter, whose lives don't matter, who no one is interested in their lives. All those untold stories, the wayward heart, the happy marriages, the unhappy marriages. Nobody's going to tell them. I'm going to tell those stories. So you became a kind of ethnographer. He would interview you. He would interview others. He interviewed my mother. And two of the stories in this collection come from my mother. And they're true. Fictionalized documentary, so to speak. Media Serafina and also a funeral in Guadalajara. I still remember Eliud, the attention and kindness and warmth in which he listened to my mother. My mother was a great storyteller because she would sit and listen to her mother and grandmother tell stories. In all those stories, the wisdom of the past was transmitted to Eliud. I remember Eliud, his chin on his hand, listening to my mother. When he published those stories, I couldn't believe the detailed memory that Eliud had as a gift. It was central to a good storytelling. And Homer was not the only one with that kind of memory. You have to remember the past, even if it's about a war, like the Trojan War. But besides that, you have a technique. And uh, you voice on the journey to both. You voice on the journey, Miguel Velasquez, who is Elu Martinez's fictional other. He's unhappy with academia because he refuses to specialize. He refused to see knowledge as a pedant's work. He believes that knowledge should transform our lives and society. He also cannot find the beginning of his novel, Voice Hunter Journey. Voice Hunter Journey, haunted by the past. He has problems with his tenure decision 1979 at UC Riverside, where he goes to Central University in an hour. He goes back to Fruitville and visits his brother Teodoro's grave. And it is at that moment close to a personal family grave that he suddenly feels the novel coming into form. He goes back to Riverside and begins to write one something genuine. His connection, therefore, with the past, with death, with Neruda's quoted passage, the past has been destroyed by the elements, the wind and air and earth that has buried every in the past. And I'm here alone to tell the story. That's what he quotes from Neruda. He becomes Neruda's other and tells the story of Mexican Americans in the Southwest. So racism, which can become a banality when people treat it without a context. And you, he lifts it up, creates a web, 
And you and I have to find our way through that way. And he helps us from the beginning by citing from and his name, from Alice Huxley, find his home in different countries that he accepts as his own tradition. So uh, it's a wonderful thing. And you, he has been, hasn't been read as much as he should because he doesn't fit with a conventional Chicano literature uh, genre or way of writing. He uh, is a person, a writer, who's going to be read in the future. He might have said, I didn't write for you today. I'm going to be read after you and most of you have turned to dust. <laughs> That's wonderful. I, I, what you were saying about your uh, the uh, the chapter on Tia Sefarina uh, being um, well um, a story your mother told. Um, cemeteries became very very important uh, in, in this book, and and many of the uh, many times Miguel often visited with his father and collector of stories, like he talked strolling through cemeteries has inspired me to write. It makes him think about um, history and about the past. And in Wero Wero, his father's stories have moved him immensely. And then in Aunt Serafina, since childhood walking through a cemetery turned him into a daydreamer. What, um, how interesting that is in terms of cemeteries and, and, and the stories that Elieu talks about are stories of what happened between date of birth and date of death. And, and he, so in, in, this, in this book, Elieu talks about those stories and about and wonders what sorrows and what joys these uh, people who are buried here have experienced. And uh, uh, so uh, he, he, uh, he does a marvelous job of, of, of uh, bringing in uh, how, how important cemeteries were to him and to this story in this, in, in, in Wero Wero. Um, I want to ask you uh, about um, the legacy of storytellers. Uh, for example, um, uh, my grandfather's horse. And, and uh, uh, could you talk more about the legacy of storytellers in, in, in the, uh, the character Miguel, Antonio, Dolores, uh, Abuela, Abuelo. Uh, yes. Um, so as to create some kind of a reasoned uh, response to you, uh, there's a spiraling of uh, stories in, in you, which eventually returns to similar or, or identical grounds. I think I already uh, answered the question of the nature of the story in a use imagination. It does something that one invents. It does something that one imagines, you know, what am I going to write? Oh, um, you know, I'm not trying to. Or I would put a love. Uh, no, uh, those are uh, retold stories from uh, tales you've heard on uh, the kitchen table. These are handed down from generation to generation, and like petals on a stream, they're nice and smooth and uh, works of art. There is the collective uh, imagination, the work of people. Now, uh, what you have in terms of place, in terms of place, we're talking about not only Texas, but also the Southwest in which the culture and history of people such as African-Americans, Mexican-Americans, Native Americans had been told by the conquerors. And therefore, the, the history of 
uh, said people. And today is a resurgence of this. And I think you mentioned that, Lars, that this is uh, a very timely kind of literature because of uh, the hatred that surrounds us. The neo Nazis marching with uh, torches, screaming, Jews will not replace us with Asian hatred, with Black Lives Matter. Eliud's writing suddenly becomes so relevant right now in terms of questioning racism and the idea of racial purity, which is a joke. So the notion of the grave to me means repressed histories, better yet distorted histories. And Eliud goes back to it from different angles and what you find at the end of Oaks Hunter journey, what do we have? A wonderful metaphor. His brother buried in a Mexican cemetery. I'm talking about Teodoro, who died in 1971, January 1971. At the end of the Eliud's Voice Hunter journey, after that marvelous four page epiphany about the history of Southwest, it ends up with a memory of that grave, that distorted history, that repressed history. You know what? Teodoro, in the novel is Alejandro. He rises from the grave, from his coffin. The idea of reincarnation, the idea of coming back, one of the great promises in Christianity, the resurrection of all of us to form a true community. That is a huge obsession against racism, the nature of stories. It can be banal stories about what happened to you. It has to be collective. It has to be uh, for the common good, so to speak, to use a cliche of right now, the common good. Yes, this is, uh, this is a so uh, graves, all those stories never told, graves, all those stories that would contest the lies about blacks, about Mexicans, about Jews, about Native Americans. And what is it that he writes about? He writes about Spaniards who come to Mexico Hiding from the Inquisition. Yes. yes. Because they are Sephardic Jews. Yes. He goes back to Cerralvo, Nuevo Leon. I was in Nuevo Leon. I went to Linares in 1985 with a Lyud to honor Luis Leal, who got to live to 103 years old. Oh, my goodness. We were there. My father was from Linares, although he migrated to Guadalajara. And what do we find? A Sephardic Jewish community in Linares. So being Mexican for or Tejano to a youth was a complicated matter. Tejano, yes. Mexicano, Sephardic Jew. And then with Serendo Mulata Blanca, there's a hint that that Mulata Blanca is one of his ancestors. And he's closer to the truth and to me to be the judge. What's it matter to claim the peoples of the world or to claim supremacy because of I inherit feature in your body, your white skin. Having a white skin is nothing. And you know that in Huero Huero. Yes. The curious yes. thing is that way, though, most people have forgotten the meaning, the Mexican sense of humor behind the term huero. And Eliud magnifies it by repeating it. It's not huero, it's huero, huero. <laughs> no, it's, it's superlatively huero. And huero, we think in terms of an egg. An egg is white. Where I come from in Guadalajara, they're so puritanical, if I may use that term, the conservative, 
they don't refer to huevos. Yes. That sounds like a man's testicle. So people call them blanquillos, little white things. Yeg blanco. Uh, un huevo güero is a rotten egg. Un huevo güero is a rotten egg. And rotten eggs, like the graves, are beautiful white on the outside, but inside there's a stick. Inside there is rot. It's a rotten egg. So huero huero means he's really rotten to the core. Now I ask you, why is huero huero? Juan Garcia rotten to the core in the view of a youth grandson. Why is he rotten to the core? Because he reneges on his Mexican ancestry. In fact, a youth grandfather almost wants to kill this guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So all of these cultural notions, backgrounds, the crisscrossing of traditions, international as well as from the grave, from his ancestors, from his community. All of this has created a poetics of Chicano literature that has not been applied only by Elio Martinez. He hasn't been discovered yet. And I can tell you, Florence, this past week I spent my evenings with Elio remembering our jokes, our discussions of literature, reading his work. I said, I have to write more about him, especially yes. now that I'm retired. I don't have to argue with my colleagues. Yes. Why don't I have more colleagues like the you, I ask myself. Hmm. Why are there so few youths with a smile, that sense of uh, because. Because Eliud was a citizen of the world. He traveled, he studied, and uh, in, in the, uh, uh, his notion, his theory, his, his of multiple ancestries, it is so, so profound because uh, Eliud talked about in the new millennium, people here in America, we're, we're all going to be, and we are people of multiple ancestries. And um, in Collector of Stories, um, Eliud writes about the profound biological transformation that took place during the first 300 years when Mexico was a colony of Spain. So um, these narratives are, they're, they're, they're a, a perspective of, of from an Iberian conquistador, a mulatto, uh, cast off from childhood because of the color of his skin. And uh, so uh, he, he talks about this. And so what we have because of multiple ancestries is we have people in Mexico, in Latin America, in many places, people with blue eyes and blonde hair, dark skin, and, and light skin and everything in between. Um, and so uh, what, what Eliud said, and I, I truly believe this, we should aspire to be citizens of the world because there is no pure race. There is no one pure ethnic group. And uh, so I think what Eliud does in this book is talk about that in short story uh, for, uh, form, and also stories that were were generated through his uh, five generations of, of his family. That one storyteller to another storyteller, and uh, so I'd like um, um, for you to uh, talk about um, who is. Miguel Velasquez, we, he, um, because he brings all these wonderful themes in, in his, his book, and, but who is he? And, and I like your perspective of, 
of uh, who Miguel Velasquez is. Francis? Yes. Um, let's press pause on that question and let's go on All over right. to Jordan for a moment and let's hear another story, but okay. we will come back to that. And I would also okay. uh, like to ask the audience if you have any questions for either uh, Francis or Roberto, please, uh, or for any of one of the family or even for uh, Inlandia and how this book came about, please put them in the Q&A box and we will be back with you uh, shortly. So before that, um, I would like to bring Jordan back to read us a story. What do you know about poverty? Thank you. One day I was outdoors talking to our Mexican gardener and something that he said or did reminded me of my father, who was also a gardener for nearly 30 years after he retired. I told him that my father could not find work because he was Mexican and that he was saddened by his inability to buy groceries for his family of eight. My mother remembered that one day the man whose name was Burati delivered a big box of groceries to our house by the creek. It included beans and rice, soap to wash clothing, and a broom. When my father protested because he did not have a job or money, Burati said not to worry. I know you will pay me when you can. And my father did. My father was very grateful. Burati was one of two brothers who owned a big store on the east side where most Mexicans lived. Much later, I learned that they loved the Mexican women who came into the store, and of course they were beautiful. The two brothers were also very decent and respectful. They always looked out for their Mexican customers. In any case, our gardener and I were talking about when I used to be poor. And that's when he said, ¿Qué sabe usted de la pobreza? What do you know about poverty or about being poor? All that I could think of at the time was that my father could not find work because he was a Mexican. And later on, I remembered El Parian, a large outdoor market where my brothers and I would go scavenging for overripe fruit and vegetables. We often brought home discarded, overripe bananas, watermelons, cantaloupes, and tomatoes. We lived in a house that had rats and cucarachas, cockroaches that were big. We had no electricity, and we had an ice box. My brother and I would go and buy ice at the nearby ice house and bring it home on tough string that we used to buy at Barati's. My father could not get work in the 1940s because he was Mexican. Sometimes beans and rice were available only for the children. There were no Christmases for the first six years of my life. I remember a little ice truck with plastic simulating ice, and that was my first Christmas present at the age of six. A few years later, my mother had to give me a belt in secret so that my brother would not know. There was no money to buy him a belt too, or for other presents, and I was the eldest. In junior high school, we would come home, take off our shoes and go barefooted to save our shoes. We wore hand-me-downs, some of them from our better off cousin Ricardo in San Antonio, Texas, who grew rapidly and outgrew his clothes. Before World War II, we started selling the Houston Chronicle. And then during the war, we used to dig for nails and junk and beer can wires, and we'd sell them to the junk man, El Señor Torres. A nickel or five cents was $500. <laughs> he used to make us laugh. And we started shining shoes for a nickel and later on selling newspapers during World War II. Young American soldiers stationed at a nearby base they were good tippers. Sometimes they'd tip as much as a quarter. My father began to help us with the 
large numbers of Sunday newspapers, the thick Sunday American statesmen. And during the week, we would earn about $2.75 a day, each of us, and my mother would give us a quarter. My mother saved money that we earned. And eventually, around 1947 or 1948, we could make the down payment on the $7,000 home where the streets were unpaved near a slaughterhouse. We had an outhouse and no driveway. What do I know about poverty? Thank you, Jordan. I think that story is uh, very illuminating. Um, I would uh, all like to go back to our discussion and I encourage you to please put questions in the Q and A. And I believe we were about to hear more about uh, Miguel Velasquez. In fact, uh, Florence uh, asked me two questions. <clears throat> and if I may, uh, perhaps now is the time to reply and respond to me. Um, Florence asked me, uh, first of all, her comment in a view that we are citizens of the world. And then she asked me about uh, Miguel Velasquez and uh, the importance or meaning of that character's role in a user life. Let me just uh, say that citizen of the world has to be read closely. Otherwise, it becomes too abstract and meaningless. Let me step go back to Eliud's writing and what he says about how he felt in elementary school under the guidance and teaching of those German and Irish elementary teachers. What do you remember by that passage? I would say it's a matter of attitude, which this country sorely needs. And Eliud knew that. Eliud knew, sees the diversity of faces among his classmates. And instead of rejecting those who are different from him, who do not look like him, he finds it amazing that humanity has so many different faces, so many different ancestries. In other words, he has a positive attitude towards otherness. So different from today. People want you to look like them. If you don't look like them, they attack you, they hate you, they slap you, they, they tell you go back to the country you came from, out there in the market. So it's a matter of attitude to reach beyond your people, to realize only then that your people are not as homogeneous as you thought. They are also very internally diverse. Have you said this? Let's go back to Miguel Velasquez. Miguel Velasquez, we know who he is if we take Eliud's word as the truth, he would say, don't do that. You have to use your imagination. He claims in Voice Hunter Journey that while in Flugaville, next to his brother's grave, he found the name Miguel Velasquez. He wrote it down and he adopted it for his fictional other or his true Corsican brother. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. When you read a work of imagination, use your imagination. And how can you use it? By knowing the artist's work thoroughly. Then you see how, at certain points, the novelist is winking at you. Do you get it? There are moments of irony. There are moments of satire. There are moments of criticism. And, uh, I was talking to uh, Florence and Kathy and, and Elise uh, a few days ago, and I shared with you my disbelief 
in my dear friend, and knowing that he's writing fiction, that he found the name on a grave next to his brother's grave, Teodoro, in Voice on the Journalist, California. And all I know is that Miguel Velasquez had to be, always had to be connected to his trinity, art, history, and faith. I chose art as my guide. Because that's what he majored in. For his bachelor's degree, he was in art, in art history. For his uh, master's degree, back to art. Because of the influence of Donald Weissman. Finally, in his PhD, it was literature, English, and comparative literature. So I thought of Miguel, I thought of Michelangelo. What gave me a clue to that? In Voice Hunter Journey, Miguel Velasquez has dreams. In those dreams, he is not Miguel Velasquez. Who is he? Who is he? He is Leonardo Correa. And that is a professor in a university in his dream who teaches Renaissance painting, Renaissance sculpture. And there's reference to Michelangelo and there's reference also to Diego Velasquez. Now, you and I know Michelangelo was not an artist associated with only one art. He was a sculptor, he was a painter, he was an architect, he was a poet. In fact, there's a disagreement as to which one is a true Renaissance man, Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo. And many will say Michelangelo. Leonardo hardly ever finished his work. <laughs> what you have in Diego Velasquez, who was Diego Velasquez? His parents were born in Portugal. As you know, Portugal was part of the Spanish Empire from 1580 to 1640. 60 years. But Portugal was a colony of Spain. And what did Diego Velasquez's parents do in Portugal? They fled because of the Inquisition. Diego Velasquez was a Sephardic Jew who ended up in the court of Philip IV and became the court's painter. Philip IV nominated him to one of the highest honors in Spain, the Orden de Santiago. But because Diego Velasquez was a Sephardic Jew, because of limpieza de sangre, the purity of blood title, he was not allowed to be part of that distinguished club. It is told that Philip IV went up and he painted the cross of Santiago on Las Meninas, which is, of course, Diego Velasquez's greatest work, painted four years before his death. Thank now, oh, I'm sorry, I want to interject here just a little because we're getting close to time, but I would like to um, ask the family too. Um, and Roberto, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, I just would love to hear some perspective from uh, the family side upon reading and all of this uh, history with uh, even with Voice Haunted Journey and with Weta Weta. Um, how has, how, what have you learned about your father and your family through these stories? And what do you think he might uh, tell other people about how to preserve their own family stories and history? And Elise, would you like to start us off? Unmute. First of all, I just and so enjoyed everything you people have to say. You're wonderful, Roberto, wonderful. Uh, Francis, you were fabulous too in your history of knowing Elude and how you brought out the questions. Everything went so well. And Jordan, you're reading. And the, I love both stories, but the last story, 
Oh my God. There's in fact a couple comments. You all should look at the chats uh, about your reading, Jordan, that they loved it. Thank you again. I, uh, yes, I am. I mean, he wanted everybody to write, you know, he always said everybody, anybody he knew, he handed them, uh, he bought them notebooks. <laughs> if you all know that, uh, you'll know that about him, all the relatives watching. He said, Every, oh, right, right, every day, right. And uh, journals keeping was very important to uh, Eliud. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm just continually overwhelmed by how brilliant and how much of a renaissance man he was it just keeps coming at me and i'm going holy cow you know this guy was something like roberto says i think he's a man of, for the future look what he says it's things that people aren't even thinking about yet the, the world being one people being one person uh, you know all the mixed uh, everyone's so mixed and we're all going to be one person someday uh he was he was misunderstood. He was never getting the credit he deserved. He's brilliant, brilliant. But let my daughters talk now about what their writing meant to him because they learned a lot by reading the stories. Tanya? Unmute, Tanya. Okay. Yeah, I'm just recalling all the times when my dad would take his little tape recorder everywhere and he would be recording. <laughs> us during dinner and anything we said he'd be like stop dad you know and now it all makes sense i know he took it to texas and everywhere um and all these stories and after he passed we were going through his office at home and uh there's so many notebooks and i started reading them and i just want to read more and i just um find it so uh, enlightening and there's so much knowledge and wisdom there that is useful now for everyone and uh, the the similarities from the past to the current is just amazing um, so that's you know standing out to me right now uh, talking about all of this and just like my mom said, how he always encouraged us to read. He gave us diaries when we were very young. And I have a stack of poems, like hundreds of pages that I just recently pulled out and was going through. And he mentions uh, Pablo Neruda. And I never even knew that, um, you know, we liked similar writers. And so it's, it's bittersweet um, because there's so much I wish I could have talked to my dad about, uh, he, he, to me, he seemed, um, I guess might be like my mom saying modest, very subdued in his knowledge. And, uh, I had no idea all of it. And, um, but I'm so grateful to have the work that he's left behind to, uh, hopefully have the time to go through and learn more and share, um, and even with the with the story about the piano, my son's, you know, happened to just do his own little concert, and it just reminded me of that. And it's just so heartwarming to be a parent now and and understand uh, what my dad felt when I was a child that I didn't understand at the time. Laura, hi there. Um, I am very, very honored and just feel so good about, you know, this um, kind of honoring of my father. And it's true, like what my sister said, um, there's so much more to my dad than I ever really knew and realized. And um, I like the way she put it as a, he was like, you know, modest, but such an incredible and knowledgeable man. <laughs> And just the way he shared his past and his father's past and his grandfather's past, he really was the historian and a person of storytelling. And he was a Renaissance man. And back, um, I'd love to read uh, um, what um, my father-in-law had written to me when my dad passed away. That's my husband's father, Frank, um, following our characteristics, which define a Renaissance man, highly educated and also self-taught extensively. 
an insatiable explorer, cultured in the arts, well-rounded skills and wide knowledge in many fields, a polymath who easily analyzes complex concepts from perspectives that his peers cannot, often challenges the norm with unconventional ideas, multilingual and very well read. Socially gifted, easily relates to all social classes, comfortable with poor as well as powerful, wealthy people, artistic, humble. And then my father-in-law said, there you have it, Laura. Your dad has all the characteristics and fits the definition perfectly. I have to agree. Thank you. I would love to hear a few final words from Francis. Also, we're, um, he was the Renaissance man. And I do, when I think about how he, he used the character of Miguel Velasquez to tell these very personal stories, but I think that was able to create the necessary distance between the personal and the historical and to make it into a, a story that um, others could relate to. Francis, you're on mute. Francis, give me mute. I'm mute. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, and I'm sorry for that. I, I'd like to uh, make a, a few comments based on quotes from Eliud himself. Artists turn their failures and shortcomings, their guilt and remorse into art. Fiction is telling truths with lies. And I thought, found that very, very <laughs> profound because, you know, uh, many of us, like per people like me, will sometimes like to write things verbatim or, or, or uh, as they really are. But Eliud always encouraged, aggrandize, make uh, this type of uh, uh, thing. So I really like what he has done in Wedo Wedo in this collection is, is much of it is autobiographical, but he has taken some liberties, artistic liberties and telling truths with a few lies here and there, perhaps, and uh, his a wonderful imagination of what life was like during the conquest, after the conquest, and all the children that were born of multiple ancestries and how society treated them. He was very sensitive about that. And uh, um, I also want uh, to, um, uh, this other quotation, because it's so relevant today, is our literary expression occupies a place within our American national literature and among the literatures of the world. And that is what Eliud Martinez's work is, it's literature of the world. Thank you, Elise, for inviting me to be part of this program. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, he was, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, my very, very favorite professor who touched me really deeply in, in, in my heart. The, um, thank you. I'm so grateful. You are so welcome and I'm so grateful for everyone today. I wanted to hear if Jordan had a couple sentences. We only have a time for a couple sentences each now. <laughs> Jordan, can you uh, sum up anything? Oh, he went away. Oh. No, I'm... I'm... I'm here, but uh, I'll let all of you speak. I would rather speak through Iliad's words. Uh, my only experience with him has been in a social uh, s setting. Um, I've had dinner um, at your house, Elise, and you guys have been at ours, and I saw uh, him at the temple, and I always loved talking with him, and I was I'm honored to be a part of today. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I would like to also extend my thanks to our distinguished panelists, Roberto Cantu and Francis J. Vasquez, um, our wonderful storyteller, Jordan Lund, for um, embodying Eliud's work, and also uh, the family, of course, Elise and Laura and Tanya, 
And I would like to just share with you one last thing before we uh, say good afternoon. Um, but we have, in his memory, we have established a new book prize for Inlandia. And it is the Eliud Martinez Prize in, uh, for a first book of prose, so creative nonfiction, nonfiction, fiction, essays, any combination of that. And uh, this will be announced um, formally soon, but uh, it will open in the fall and it will be open to any writer who identifies as Chicano, Chicana, Latino, Latina, Hispanic, um, anyone who has not yet published a first book. So if you would like uh, more information about this, or if you would like to contribute to the ongoing um, support of this prize, which will be an annual prize, please send an email to me uh, at inlandia at inlandia institute dot org. And, um, you know, I do, I thank everyone here today. I thank you for being here, our audience. Uh, just to let you know, we have another event next week on uh, Thursday, June 10th at 6 p.m. Another important conversation. Uh, this is in partnership with the Museum of Riverside and the Harada House Foundation. If only we dare, from the Harada story to ending Asian hate, and it includes uh, guest speakers, including Mark Takano, as well as uh, an introduction by our city manager, Al Zalinka. So you may RSVP for that at tinyurl slash and AAPI hate. So until we meet again, thank you all. And uh, we will see each other here sometime again. Uh, wait, wait, Katie, uh, oh, yes. is, is there a way to know uh, for people who couldn't come today because of graduations and so on, you were going to tell us about a site they could uh, maybe uh, uh, be able to see it on another way uh, that taped or something? Sure. Yes. So um, this has been recorded and it will be up on Inlandia's YouTube channel. Um, that's also easy to find, uh, tiny URL slash Inlandia YouTube. Or you can just Google Inlandia YouTube and it'll be the first entry. So if you missed it, or if you can also see it on our Facebook page via Facebook Live, it is archived there under videos. So many ways. Excellent. And, Thanks. Yep. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, be well and take care. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.